everyone, welcome back. We're diving into a topic today that I know a lot of you have been requesting the Ukrainian language. It's a fascinating one for sure, full of little twists and turns. It is. And we've got a ton of interesting stuff to unpack, linguistic analyses, historical accounts, even some cultural insights. We're going to uncover those aha moments for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Now, I've heard this one a lot, and I'm curious to get your take on it. Is Ukrainian just a dialect of Russian? Ah, the <laughs> age-old debate. Okay, so to clear things up, it's a bit more complex than that. I had a feeling you were going to say that. So what's the real story? Think of it this way. Dialects are like branches on the same tree. They share a lot, but have their quirks. I'm with you so far. Ukrainian and Russian. Two separate trees entirely. Maybe even different species in the linguistic forest. You know? Okay, I love that analogy. So how did these trees grow so distinct if they share common roots? Well, it's a combination of factors, really. Centuries of invasions, empires rising and falling, cultural mingling. You name it, Ukrainians seen it. Talk about a rich history. So it's got that old East Slavic base, but with layers upon layers of other influences. Exactly. We're talking Polish, Lithuanian, even a sprinkle of German and Yiddish in there. Wow, hold on. That's a lot to process, even for a language enthusiast like me. And here's the thing. Each influence adds its own flavor. Take, for instance, this historical tidbit back in the 17th century, when they needed translators for a treaty between Russia and well, what's now Ukraine. Wait, they needed translators? I thought they were supposed to be speaking practically the same language. That's the point. It proves that even back then, these languages were already distinct enough to need that separation. Makes you think, right? It really does. It's like language isn't just about communication. It's also a powerful tool, a way to assert identity and sometimes maybe even dominance. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And that's where things get even more interesting. This whole dialect versus language debate, it's often been used politically. Okay, so it wasn't just a linguistic argument. There is an agenda behind it. Oh, absolutely. Downplaying Ukrainian as a mere dialect it was a way to diminish its importance, you know, almost like trying to say it's not a real language, so it doesn't deserve the same respect. Wow, that adds a whole other layer to it. Right. But when we look at the evidence, the historical texts, the fact that they needed translators for official agreements, it all points to Ukrainian being its own distinct entity. It's got its own rhythm, its own soul. I'm hooked. So tell me more about how this unique language evolved. I mean, we're talking about centuries of history here. Absolutely. We've got to start with the foundation old East Slavic roots. Think back to the Kaivon Rus's, this powerful empire, a melting pot even back then, shaping everything from religion to, you guessed it, language. Okay, so the Kaivon Rus's, that's like way, way back. What came after that? Well, the lands we know as Ukraine today, they came under Lithuanian rule and then Polish rule. And let me tell you, those cultural exchanges, they left their mark. Ever heard the Ukrainian word for always? Zazdi. That's straight from Polish. Wow, I had no idea. It's amazing how these influences weave their way in. Right. Even some words with Latin roots, they snuck in through Polish, like raptum, which means suddenly. It's like a linguistic puzzle, piecing together these influences. It's incredible. It's like Ukrainian was collecting souvenirs from all these different cultures, adding them to its own unique identity. What other linguistic souvenirs did it pick up along the way? Well, with German settlers arriving in the 13th century, we see words related to trades and crafts becoming part of the Ukrainian lexicon, like dach for roof. And later, Yiddish, spoken by Jewish communities, added its own flavor, especially in terms of trade and commerce. These weren't just random words. They reflected the realities of the time. It's amazing how language adapts like that, reflecting the changing world around it. Absolutely. But we can't forget about the elephant in the room, can we? We have to talk about the influence of the Russian Empire. Yeah. That had to have a huge impact, right? Oh, absolutely. That's where our story takes a bit of a complicated turn. Okay, so the Russian Empire enters the scene. Things are definitely about to get interesting. I mean, how did Ukrainian hold its own under that kind of pressure? Well, it's, how do I put it, a bit of a balancing act. The Russian Empire definitely wanted to exert its influence, but it wasn't a clean sweep, not at all. Oh, I bet there are some good stories in there. Give me an example. All right, picture this. Soviet-era banknotes, right? Hmm. At the height of Russian dominance. Gotcha. You'd expect to see just Russian on them, wouldn't you? Yeah, that makes sense. But here's the thing. They display denominations in all 15 republic languages, oh. including, you guessed it, Ukrainian. Wow, really? That seems kind of counterintuitive, considering... 
Well, everything. Why go through the effort? Because it reveals that complex dance between politics and language I was mm -hmm. talking about. It's like they wanted to maintain this facade of unity and respect for these different cultures. But let's be real. Russian was the favored child. Right, right. Yeah. And still, the presence of Ukrainian on those banknotes, it speaks volumes. It's like a subtle act of defiance. So how did this whole balancing act play out in everyday life? Did people in Ukraine just switch to Russian? Not at all. Ukrainian remained this vibrant part of daily life, especially within families, communities. But there was this one pivotal moment. Our sources highlight the 1958 school reform in Soviet Ukraine. School reform. Okay, how does that tie into the bigger picture of language? Okay, imagine you're a parent in Soviet Ukraine back then, right? You're faced with this choice. Which language should your child learn in school? On the surface, it seems like you have options. Right. But here's the catch. Russian, it's seen as the language of opportunity of advancement. Ukrainian, not explicitly banned, but subtly nudged to the side. I see, I see. So it's like the door's not locked, but there's definitely a preferred entrance. Exactly. And over time, that message sinks in. This subtle pressure couples with the dominance of Russian in media, in government. Ukrainian increasingly becomes confined to the home. It's fascinating how these unspoken rules, these almost invisible forces, can shape a language's destiny. It really is. But then, of course, boom, the Soviet Union collapses. Huge changes everywhere. How did that impact Ukrainian? Talk about a turning point. It was like this collective sigh of relief, a chance to reclaim what was lost. Remember how we talked about language being so intertwined with identity? Yeah. Well, with the birth of an independent Ukraine, declaring Ukrainian as the official language, it wasn't just symbolic. It was a declaration. It was a statement. So Ukrainian was back in the spotlight. Did that translate into real change on the ground? Did people actually start using it more? Oh, absolutely. There was this conscious effort to revive the language in schools, in government, in the media, everywhere. This deliberate push to reverse decades of, well, suppression. A real linguistic comeback story. You could say that. What about in Kiev, the capital? I imagine that was a bit of a stronghold for Russian, wasn't it? Kiev is really interesting. For years, yeah, it was a predominantly Russian-speaking city. But after independence, there was a noticeable shift, this upsurge in Ukrainian usage. People were eager to embrace their own language again. So that's Kyiv. But what about the rest of Ukraine? Did this resurgence reach all corners of the country? Well, the 2001 census, it paints a pretty clear picture. Nearly 88% of Ukraine's population reported fluency in Ukrainian. Now, of course, language use, it varies, right? Yeah. Russian is still more common in some eastern and southern regions. Right, of course. But... Ukrainian's position as the national language, that's undeniable. It really speaks to the resilience of language, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. It goes to show you, language can adapt, it can evolve, even in the face of immense change. Absolutely. Speaking of evolution, let's talk about the language itself. What makes Ukrainian unique beyond its, shall we say, eventful history? Uh, Ukrainian is full of quirks. Okay, you say it yourself. Ukrainian is full of quirks. Give me the good stuff. What are some of those linguistic gems that make it so unique? Oh, I've got a good one. Have you ever heard about Ukrainians' use of the vocative case? The vocative case. Refresh my memory. What is that again? So imagine you want to call out to someone, like let's say your sister. In English, you probably say something like, hey, sister. Mm -hmm. right? But in Ukrainian... You use a special form of the word sister, sestro. It's like this direct, almost intimate way of addressing someone. And it's something modern Russian has mostly lost. Wow, that's fascinating. It's like Ukrainian has this special linguistic tool for adding that extra layer of emotion. Exactly. It's one of those little things that gives the language so much character. <laughs> I love that. Okay, what else? What other linguistic treasures are hidden in Ukrainian? Let's talk sounds. You know how our Russian-speaking friends would say noga for leg? Yeah, noga? Well, Ukrainians, they swap that G for an H, noha. Subtle difference, but it actually points to this cool connection. Ukrainian shares that H sound with Czech and Slovak. It's like finding these little echoes across different languages. I love that. Right, and it shows you how interconnected these languages can be, even when they've evolved in different directions. It's like a big linguistic family reunion. <sighs> All right, hit me with another one. What else makes Ukrainian stand out? Okay, let's talk about how Ukrainian talks about the future. It's got this really interesting way of forming its future tense, very different from English. Okay, most languages have a future tense. What's so special about how Ukrainian does it? 
It's called a synthetic future, and it's something you'd more likely find in romance languages. Think Spanish, Italian, that kind of vibe. Really? So Ukrainian is borrowing from romance languages now? Well, not exactly borrowing, but it's a fascinating parallel. You see, in Ukrainian, the future meaning it's baked right into the verb itself. So instead of saying, I will write, like in English and Ukrainian, it's gusadimu, the future is already embedded in there. Wow, that's a completely different way of thinking about it. Ukrainian never ceases to amaze me. But we can't talk about a language without talking about its literature, right? Absolutely. Ukrainian literature is incredibly rich and vibrant, with iconic figures like Taras Shevchenko, Lysi Ukrenka. Their works are full of raw emotion, exploring themes of national identity, resistance, really powerful stuff. You mentioned resistance. Do Ukrainian writers ever use their craft to, well, subvert restrictions, especially under pressure to conform? Oh, for sure. There's this great example, Ivan Kotlyarevsky, a writer from the late 18th century. He was a master of satire and used it brilliantly in his work, Enaida, to get around censorship. Can you imagine? Using humor and wordplay to outsmart the censors. Talk about the power of language. Right. It shows that even in the face of adversity, creativity always finds a way. It's inspiring. And it makes you wonder, how is Ukrainian culture making its mark on the world today? Oh, in so many ways. Ukrainian music, for example, is having a real moment. Bands like Oki and Elzy are selling out stadiums, not just in Ukraine, but across Europe and beyond. It just goes to show you how language can transcend borders, how it can bring people together through art, through music. It's like the language itself is singing its own unique song on the world stage. Well, as we wrap up our deep dive into the Ukrainian language, I think the biggest takeaway for me is its resilience. I mean, we've talked about the historical pressures, the cultural influences, and yet here it is, vibrant, evolving, and more relevant than ever. It just makes you appreciate the power of language, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And you know, it makes you wonder, what other hidden gems are out there tucked away in the nooks and crannies of the world's languages, waiting to be discovered and celebrated? Now, those are words to ponder. So to our listeners, we encourage you keep exploring, keep asking questions, because the world of languages with all its richness and complexity is yours to discover.